the difficult questions, of the difficult questions, um, we have one which has come up uh, fairly recently, uh, people utilizing the general uh, repulsion that society holds against pedophiles and all the cases of pedophilia coming up here in the UK and in Europe and all this kind of thing. So that has become now a point of attack. Jerry Falwell, one of the evangelists in America, he made this statement on public television that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a pedophile. He was seven, you know, 53 years old and he married you know, a nine-year-old girl, right? So this became you know, a, a source of attack on Muslims. And um, obviously he got that information from having you know, some intimate information about Islam. The average Christian may not bring this up because if you haven't studied the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you wouldn't know this. You know? So you may run into it. It just depends if, you're coming, if somebody's coming from America you know, and they were familiar with what was going on in the television because it was repeated a few times in national television in the U.S. You know, so that accusation is there. So if they've been influenced by that, then you can hear it. Otherwise, the average Christian has no idea about it, so you may not have to deal with it. But in any case, it's still a concept that we should have a clear understanding of because each one of each and every one of us has a natural repulsion to a pedophile and if you actually put the Prophet Sallallahu marriage to Aisha in this context you know it does seem to be something which needs some kind of explanation for us to have peace of mind and peace of heart right I mean we may have accepted it automatically but not really thought about it so what is the uh, way in which we should understand this? First and foremost, it is important for us to understand it within you know, the context of the time. That in these times, uh, people have set laws in terms of what ages people can marry at and what ages they can't. They have set a certain set of laws where uh, if one has relations with a woman who is, or a young lady, who is below a certain age, then they will consider that to be pedophilia. And if she's above that age, then it's considered to be, and it was consensual, consensual sex, which is okay. The point is that when you go and look at the numbers across Europe, you will find that it varies from country to country varying all the way from 12 to 18. So it just depends on which country you go to, from France to Germany to Netherlands to Italy to Spain. You know, you're going around those different countries, you'll find the numbers varying from 12 to 18. So what may be considered uh, acceptable relations in one country is considered to be pedophilia in another country. So they have numbers that they have set to define where, where con, uh, consensual sex is acceptable or not. For us in Islam, we have a natural principle, a natural dividing line, which is for a woman to be considered an, an, an adult or that she may be married and have sexual relations, etc that dividing line is puberty. That is a natural dividing line. Puberty is the body saying that that young lady is now capable of bearing a child. That's what puberty is about for females. Menstruation. So whether one in this society considers that person still to be a child or not, that's not the issue. The issue is that biologically, she is now an adult capable of bearing a child. That is the bottom line. And it's a natural division. And that will take into account variations which exist amongst people, amongst tribes, areas of the world, etc. Because you'll find that number varying. 
In Arabia, nine was a common age for puberty. Other countries, it varied. So that was the that was the point. This was the dividing line. When we're talking about pedophilia, what is pedophilia anyway? Is pedophilia really adults going and marrying children? No. The pedophiles were coming out of Britain and Germany. This is the most largest uh, body of pedophiles in the U.S. You know, going into Southeast Asia to Thailand, to Sri Lanka, the Philippines, these countries where people are in poverty, right? And where, you know, young children have sold themselves, sold, sell their bodies to, to earn money. And where parents will be willing to sell their children for money. These people who go there, are they going there to marry these kids? No. They're going there to abuse them, just to, to take pleasures and then leave. So it's not about marriage at all. So when we look in terms of the Prophet Muhammad's situation, this was marriage. So one, we have a natural dividing line, puberty. Two, we have the issue of whether it was marriage or whether it was sexual abuse. And uh, when we consider, really, 1,400 years ago, what were the ages in which people were considered to be marriageable and not. I'm sure, I'm not, I haven't studied uh, British history or not, but I'm sure if you go back in British history 1,400 years ago and look at the marriage customs of that time, it's not going to be any different. So you would end up having to go back and label the British kings as pedophiles and all these other kinds of things too. So this is the point is that in the world at that time they didn't have uh, they had not set these older ages that we now find 18 and 16 and 18 this type of thing as they have here today. People matured faster. Life was shorter. You know, if you made it to 50, you know, you're an old, really old person. You you know, that's you've lived your life out. People died 35 as an old person. 35, 40, you died, then you, you died an old person. So life was, people developed much faster. As soon as the child reaches a certain age, they were taught the basic things that uh, a person should know, how to run a f family, take care of a home, cook, and all the different things that were needed. Children learned that. What we call children today learned that. So. Where today you can find a woman in her 20s studying in university, she still doesn't know how to cook, she can't iron, you know, she's basically a baby still going to university. I mean, this was something in those days inconceivable. Right? So, the attitudes of society towards responsibility and all this kind of thing have changed. Consider Usama ibn Zaid, who Prophet made the head military commander for the Muslim armies. 17 years old. Imagine putting, you know, 17 year old, the head of the Pentagon, you know, he's got his finger, he can press any button and send missiles all over the world. Hey, we would be in World War III in a minute, right? So we know that it's a, there was a whole different level of maturity. People matured at a whole different pace. So we always have to look at these things within the context. And then we look at the consequences. People who have suffered from pedophilia in childhood. What about those people when they reach adulthood? These people have problems. They got psychological problems. They're going to psychiatrists and you know, they've got all kinds of... Who was Aisha? Aisha was one of the leading scholars of the Ummah, the fourth most prolific narrator of hadiths, you know scholar of Sharia, honored by the Ummah. She wasn't a person with, you know, psychological problems and all this kind of thing. Her life was just shattered, no. So obviously, that whole marriage situation was a legitimate marriage. It had nothing to do with pedophilia in any way, shape or form. It was uh, a legitimate marriage which produced, you know, positive and good results. And it was a marriage of that time. But it remains 
legitimate that if a Muslim man in his 50s even today wanted to marry a young woman who was 9 or 10, she had reached puberty, it is legitimate. The fact that the world is not doing it, in most places people are not doing it, doesn't mean that it no longer is permissible. No. It remains. And in some societies, I know for example in India, though you know the whole issue of what they call child marriages, they try to ban it. It is officially illegal. But they have shown that well over 50% of marriages taking place in India today, in spite of the banning and everything else, the, the girls are marrying under age, what they consider to be under age, which is like 16. 16 and under, they're marrying, till today, across India. So, these are uh, societies that are following principles which have been handed down over generations and the people have not understood that in terms of abuse. Now there are other people who may abuse and certain elements of abuse has happened you know where you know Arabs from uh, from the Gulf area having a lot of money have gone into India and you know basically bought brides, child brides you know and so there's an element of abuse there and they've made uh, issues about it in the newspaper etc. But that is an exception that is not the rule. The um, other point, which is a controversial point, can create some problems, is the issue that Islam permits husbands to beat their wives. Right? This is the heading. We had a, there was one imam there in France, right, who got kicked out of the country. Wasn't it just uh, some, maybe about six months or so back, there was an imam who, uh, because they had record of him saying that husbands could beat their wives, and, and there was an imam in Spain also, who, you know, they made a big thing about it, how he had, he was even describing to the people how they should beat their wives. <laughs> you know, that's how they put it, right? And, uh, you know, big, big, uh, they wanted to cancel his citizenship and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, because Islam permits a, a man to beat his wife. Right. as a statement. The reality, of course, is that uh, though Islam permits a man to hit his wife, it is within a certain context. Remember, when we look at Western society today, which doesn't allow even parents to hit their children, we can understand sensitivities. Right? Even a parent today is not allowed to hit their child. I don't know exactly what the laws are here in the UK, but I know in um, in America and Canada they're very, 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 very uh, strict. If you hit your child and your child reports you to the uh, authorities, child welfare authorities, that child will be taken out of your possession, taken away from you, taken out of your home, and you can be charged. So there's a whole different attitude that has developed in the society towards the concept of corporal punishment in general. So naturally the idea that now you can hit a wife, oof, this is something, but we have to stop and say, listen, okay you all, you're making all this noise about Islam saying that you can hit a wife. And we don't need to go, before we even going into what are the conditions, you know, the details concerning it, etc. We have to look at it from this perspective. Yes. Islam says a man may hit his wife. But in your society, are men hitting their wives? Hmm? What kind of a rate do you have here of men beating on their wives? You know? The number of women that are killed in the society, under what circumstances are they killed? You'll find that the majority of cases are husbands killing their wives. This is where the women are dying. They're dying in the homes. This is the same country that says it's illegal. We have put it in the laws, you cannot hit your wife and the wives are being beaten up, to, you know, left and right at a scale which is, you know, plague scale. And you go into the Muslim society, it's true. Some husbands are beating their wives too. But is it comparable? Not at all. Not at all. Why? Because the family structure, in spite of all the problems that Muslims have, the family structure is still intact. 
when you marry a young lady, you're marrying into a family. A family, a father, a brother, you know, uncle, cousins, who are concerned about their relative. So if she comes home to visit, and she's got a black eye and a broken arm, I mean, you're not going to say, what happened? You know, well, my husband beat me. Oh, it's too bad. No, that's not how you're going to react. The father is going to be upset. What is this? The brother is going to be upset. They're going to go and see that guy and say, hey, what are you doing here? You know, you better not be beating on our daughter here. You know, otherwise we'll have to come over and deal with you. You know, you understand? I mean, you got to make it plain. You don't want somebody doing that to you. But in, in the societies where families are broken down, it's just a man, his wife, and his kids. Those kids grow up, they're out. They're on their own. You know, a brother doesn't care what happens to his sister. Father doesn't care what happens to his daughter. You know, it's your problem. <laughs> you married him. You know, that's the kind of an attitude. So, naturally, that breeds abuse. It breeds a situation of abuse. Whereas, with the extended family intact, then the chances of abuse are much less. And as I said, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And maybe in some of the Muslim cultures, it's sort of accepted. You know? Because we talked... Um, I didn't talk about it, but we have the issues of um, honor killings, you know, which is a form of uh, an ext extended form of honor killing, which uh, in some areas of the Muslim world they have more they more or less accept it, but Islam, of course, is opposed to it. So the point is that uh, one, the legislation which the West has has not guaranteed safety for women; they're still being abused on a massive scale. Secondly, uh, there are in the Islamic family structure uh, safeguards which help to protect the women regardless of what the legislation says. Thirdly, the, a man hitting his wife is in, in, on a very limited scale and that hitting is not punishment that he's going to beat like you might hit a child to punish the child for having done something wrong. It is not like this. It is only to catch her attention where talk has failed. To catch her attention where talk has failed. Somebody is walking by, you want to catch your attention, hey, like this. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about putting on boxing gloves and, you know, blackening eyes and breaking arms and things like this. No, this is not, this is not what Islam says. Prophet said if you, hit a, you should not hit a woman and cause her skin to bruise. And this is where the Imam got himself in trouble. He's trying to say, okay, if you hit her, make sure you don't bruise her skin. Make sure you don't, you know. So he's explaining what is really is not allowed. That means he's trying to define for you that the hit should not be a heavy hit. That should be very light. Only something of basically tapping catching her attention, wake up, you know, our marriage is falling apart. Not, I divorce you and before you go I'm going to leave you with a black eye, <laughs> you know, get my revenge before you leave. No, this is, not the, uh, this is not the principle involved here at all. So we need to put it in that uh, kind of a context and we need to also defend the right to corporal punishment because Prophet ﷺ said, teach your children salah when they're seven, and spank them for it when they're 10. Spank them for it when they're 10. So that's society which says, no, you can't hit your children. We have to take a stand. We have to take a stand. And I mean, the consequence of them taking away the right for parents to hit their children, we know what is happening in the schools today and in the society. The rebellion that is going on, where people feel, you know, free to attack the public. You're, you're, you're not safe, you know, in the society. Because once you take away that corporal punishment, then people feel there is no consequence for my acts. I can do anything I want. And that is the reality. And that leads us also to the idea of corporal punishment in Islam in general. You know, we Muslims still hold that a person who murders should be executed. Whereas the UN has already decided that this is unfair, unjust, etc. Um, many countries have followed that lead. And so the idea that people are still executing, and they'd like to take out some old films from Saudi Arabia and that, you know, where 
somebody's head is being chopped off and I said, look at these people, you know. And um, this idea of corporal punishment, you know, presenting Islam in a very ugly light. We kill murderers. Well, yeah, we kill drug dealers too. You know, we'll kill rapists. I mean, there are people in the society who will be executed. There is a consequence for their acts. Then we have to look to see, uh, in the West, their attitude towards uh, penal uh, punishment, you know, through uh, corporal means, etc., in prison, etc. It has changed over the years. In the beginning, they did recognize that, that uh, corporal punishment was necessary for retribution, the society they p should get back at the person who has done a crime against the society, that's retribution. It should also be uh, for deterrence, that a person knows there's a consequence for your crime, so therefore it should discourage you from doing it. And thirdly, it is for reformation, to help to reform these members of the society, where the punishment is not death, but it is lashes or whatever else. However, from the 50s, the attitude towards punishment changed in the West in general, in the US, in the UK, etc. And they said basically, they took the position that punishment for revenge, or what they call retribution, or for deterrence was not producing the results which justified its application. So they said the purpose of jailing people, you know, the, cons the, the science of penology changed its approach to crime and said the purpose of uh, putting people in prison, incarcerating people, etc., this should be for reformation. That person, that criminal, should be looked at as somebody who has been, who is sick. He's a sick person who needs to be treated. Right? He's sick because the society has made him sick. So now the blame is now put on the society. They're the ones, for one way or another, who caused him to be in the state that he is. So we need to just reform him. So this is the attitude that they, they, they change to. But of course, what is the consequence? The consequence is that, as I mentioned here, in, um, in the UK, uh, they're saying that uh, the Home Secretary announced on the 22nd of April, this is 1970s, this is ages ago, that the death penalty was well, abolished here in UK from 1965, that 172 convicted murderers had been released from prison since 1960, most of them having served nine years or less for their statutory life sentences. They're being given life sentences, but the majority of them, right, were only serving less than uh, nine years. Only five served 12 or more. Nine served six or less, and one completed only six months. Murdered and was out in six months. So, where you have these kinds of statistics, then it's no, no surprise that uh, murder is easy. People are being killed left and right. You, you know, just in the, paper, in the news today or yesterday, a little girl, 14 years old, walking home in Nottingham or whatever, she is uh, gunned down, killed in the streets, you know, for no apparent reason. Uh, and um, the overall rate of crime has been rising. In the West, in spite of all the technology, all the success they've had in terms of economics, etc., the rate of crime is rising. Practically speaking, in the Muslim world, there are a number of cases, Sudan being one of them, where they introduced the Sharia in the uh, mid-80s, and within months of its application, the crime rate had dropped some 40%. Proven in Iran also, where they introduced Sharia. I mean, besides issues of Sunnah Shia, but where they introduced the Sharia with its penalties, crime rate dropped. In Afghanistan, where they introduced the Sharia, dropped dramatically. And so we can see 
there is a consequence, there is a result, a positive result which has come from the application of the Sharia. It is a deterrent. So we defend Islamically the right to execute those who murder. Now the attitude in the West in general towards murder is different from that in Islam. In Islam when a person commits murder, this is a crime against people. It's not a, considered to be crime against society. In the West it's considered to be a crime against society. So they have a jury uh, decide whether this person should be executed or not. Whereas from the Islamic perspective, this is the decision of not people external to the family, but to the family members themselves. You know? So when, if Western people or non-Muslims, whatever, raise the issue that, hey, somebody commits murder amongst you and you all can decide to let him go. Family members can say, let him go. Don't kill him. You know? How is that? Well, we look at it that the crime is against the family. So they are the best ones to decide, shall I let this person go? Or shall this person be given the full force of the law? They are the ones who suffered the loss. Rather than turning it over to other people who, uh, you know, have their, maybe their own interests, maybe affected by a variety of different things. The judge, the jury, had a bad day, bad night. They come in, and they're gung-ho, they want kill this guy. You know, kill him. Who can I kill today? <laughs> you know? So it becomes a means of just taking off your frustrations or your anger. You know, your person's life can depend on that. So Islam says, no, this is the right of the individual to apply it. Of course, the issue of uh, death penalty for adultery, this the case of uh, Amina Lawal, in Nigeria, this was a big, big case, and Oprah Winfrey and a bunch of other people got in behind it, you know, saved this woman's life. And, and um, you know, the big issue was raised, how, look at it, they're going to kill her, and the man who did it, he's getting off scot-free. She identified who it was, and they're not going to apply the law to him. It's only her. You know, so there are two issues. First issue, in terms of the law being applied to her and not him, she had a child. So we have no doubt she wasn't married. She had been married and divorced. Right? She had a child. So there's no doubt that she committed adultery. Now the man that she had fingered, she identified, can we just say, well, she identified him so we'll kill him too? No. The law doesn't operate like that. Because maybe he wasn't the one. Maybe this is just somebody she didn't like. And she said, okay, if I have to die, I may as well kill him too. <laughs> yeah, let him die along with me, you know. Whereas the person I really love, who is really the father, <laughs> I don't want him to die. So, so that's, not in, that's not evidence. We don't use that as evidence. Right? So this issue of her and not him, this is not an issue. The other issue about killing an adulterer or an adulteress, stoning them to death. Of course, this is not a law which Islam, Muslims, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi introduced himself. This is already in your Bible. This is in your Bible. This is not something we introduced. It's already in your Bible. Right? This is the law, the law of Moses. So, the, the question comes, still, you're killing somebody for that crime. We have to say to them, you have an issue about it now. Why? Because adultery is no longer a crime for you. Adultery fornication is something that you have taken for granted. It's okay. Everybody's doing it. We have presidents doing it. You know? <laughs> you know? We have presidents and nobody's got, you know, it was a little bit of uh, dicey stuff, you know, for a while there, but, you know, basically, people got by his, because this is the times, this is the different times. So the idea of society which has accepted its leaders to be involved in adultery as being okay, because everybody else is doing it anyway. Why should we kill him or why should we, you know, depose him or remove him as president when we are doing the same thing? Should we have a double standard of morality that is okay for us but not for our president? No, no. They say no. It's just, you know, we know it's, uh, though before we didn't used to like it and that, but times have changed, right? Okay, so naturally, a society which looks at this in this way, Naturally, the idea to go kill somebody for it, no, ooh, that's, that's very severe, very extreme. Right? But for us, 
It's a different outlook. Why does Islam have such a severe punishment for adultery? Why? It, it relates back to the family. It destroys the family. It's breaking down the root of your society. The foundation of your society is being destroyed. The family is the key. Once you destroy that, your society is finished. So in order to preserve the family, whatever would attack the family is dealt with very severely in Islamic law. And that's why. And really this law, we have to tell the people, listen, this law is a deterrent. Mainly. Because for you to apply it, unless a woman has a baby, or a woman and a man confess, then to actually catch somebody in the act, because it requires four witnesses, four adult witnesses to see them in the act. No photographs, because photographs can be doctored. Right? Four adult witnesses. What does that mean? That means that that person had to be so public that they deserve to be killed. So, it is more of a deterrent than it is really a law which is applied on a regular basis. The number of people who have been executed for adultery over the last hundred years, minimal. A very small number of people around the Muslim world. So, we use that you know, to clarify that Islam takes a very strong position for the protection of the foundation of the society itself. Also the issue of uh, cutting off hands. This is another issue that people raise uh, and they usually describe it in the newspaper as hacking off hands. You know, Muslims, they hack off the hands of a, murder, of a thief. So that implies you get a hacksaw and you start to saw off the person's hand. Very brutal. Or they say chopping off hands. That gives you the idea of a meat cleaver, right? The butcher chops the meat. So he's chopping off the hands. This is how they put it. Trying to put it as gory as possible. I mean, it's his amputation. The limb is cut off. It is true. And there's a website on the, um, on the internet which uh, is, it comes in when you come to it. It's about the hand, right? And it um, shows you all the things that the hand does, the wonders of the hand, how the muscles work, and you know, and, you know, and uh, beautiful. This is a beautiful creation of God, you know, beautiful. At the end of it, it says, "And Muslims cut it off." <laughs> you, see, you know, this is an indirect attack, right? I'm just showing you how beautiful a hand is, wonder of Allah's creation, and Muslims cut it off. <laughs> so, uh, for us, you know, we explain to them, listen, we don't just cut it off like that in the first place, right? There are conditions. It has to be over a certain value. It had to have been something which wasn't in public. It's left out, where people are tempted, and they take it. This is against the professional thief, one who is a pickpocket. You know, you don't pick people's pocket by accident. You know, you have to practice and train at it. You know, a person who robs a bank, who, you know, cracks into your home. These are professional thieves. This is who it's directed at. And we have to say that when that hand is cut off, or the threat of having the hand cut off, it is a deterrent in the society. It keeps safety, it preserves the safety of that society. I mean, you can, I, I lived personally in Saudi Arabia for 20 years, and I can say quite easily that I never had a latch on my front door. I didn't have a lock on my front door. We regularly left the front door. It was just pulled and that's it. Anybody could open the door and come walking in. You try to do that here. That's very dangerous. I notice people come in their homes, there's locks and padlocks and you know, we have things you codes and you know. 
And even I was shocked when I came back at one point coming here to the UK. I saw getting out of a car with a friend of mine. It was in, in Birmingham. He was pulling out the, the tape recorder with him. I said, <laughs> why are you doing that? You know, yeah, If I leave it in the car, somebody will break the window just to get at it. You know. They invented the way now you can just take off the front of the tape recorder, right? You don't have to take off the whole thing anymore, make it smaller. But, I mean, what? There's no security. That's one of the things, actually, which caused a lot of people to accept Islam in uh, the Gulf area, in Saudi Arabia especially, you know, is that sense of security. Somebody was asking me before about what was the reason after the Gulf War we had in a center where I was involved, about 3,000 people accept Islam, you know, within about five months after the war. And uh, this was back in the early 90s. And one of the big reasons that, that people accepted Islam was this th sense of security. They felt a sense of security in the country. They were coming in, we'd take them, help them buy gold jewelry and that, and they would wear it openly. Say, you know, we couldn't possibly do this back home. Go to New York, Chicago, you know, wear gold? Ha! Huh. <laughs> That's asking for somebody to take your hand off. They'll take your hand off to get that ring or that, you know. They'll take your hand off in a minute. So. That sense of security, this, where does this come from? It comes from the threat of punishment. As well as, of course, the belief people have, you know, with words to law, God, etc. But that threat of punishment backs up that belief, supports it. Um, Uh, there is one other point, which is um, commonly mentioned in the West, uh, here in the UK and in uh, North America, the attitude of Muslims towards homosexuals. We are labeled as being homophobic, right? You know, we are. We have un the unfortunate disease of homophobia, mental disease of homophobia. Right? Of course, we have to remind them that the whole of the West was homophobic, you know, 40 years ago. Go back 40 years ago, and homosexuals were hidden. They said they're in the closet. You know, they would hide their homosexuality. They wouldn't openly show it in the society. The average Brit, American, Canadian, you ask them, what's your thoughts on homosexuality? They would say, this is evil. It's corrupt, sinful, bad. Maybe they'll quote from the Bible, it's an abomination unto the Lord, you know, whatever. But by the 70s, the whole talk changed, didn't it? It became alternative lifestyles, right? Personal choices, different strokes for different folks. You know, they have all kinds of names to, <laughs> to try to explain that, you know, you do your thing, I do mine, you know. You don't bother me, I don't bother you, you know. This is a whole different attitude. And really, in the medical profession, that change took place. Because before, back in the 60s, homosexuality was considered to be an illness, a mental illness. And they had treatment for it. In the psychiatrist's uh, handbook, they had treatments, shock treatments, drug treatments, a variety of treatments. But by the late 70s, it was removed. No longer an illness, replaced by homophobia. So we who used to despise them, consider it to be evil, etc., we are now the sick ones. We need to go lie on the psychiatrist's couch and get reprogrammed. Okay. So, I mean, of course, they have a variety of arguments to defend it. They're mentioned there in the notes, 97, 98, you know, and it's good to be aware of, of their, their arguments. And their arguments, of course, in the end, don't hold water. In the end, uh, where they try to claim that this is something natural, they're born with it, you know, how can we, you know, oppose it when it is something uh, natural? We say, we don't accept that it's something natural. Yes, people may have tendencies. And life experiences may uh, focus on certain tendencies and cause them to rise. Tendencies which are not good tendencies. I mean, because if we're going to say, okay, a um, person's homosexual because they're born homosexual with these tendencies, then you can say that about the pedophile too. Or about the murderer. Or about, you know, any other criminal. 
you know, they, they, they have arguments about, about this uh, being in the genes. So we don't accept this. People have tendencies, but they are not robots programmed where you have to do whatever you, you have tendencies for. No, we have an ability to choose. You may feel a desire to do something, but you know it is wrong and you stop yourself. And there should be a consequence for that. So we don't accept the arguments that people are born homosexuals. This has never been proven medically. Biologically, it has not been proven. People have tried to make claims. They brought up arguments. I've mentioned some of them in the notes here, you know, but they have all fallen and proven themselves to be false. The last major point I'd like to touch on in terms of our difficult questions is the issue of uh, religious freedom. You are Muslim, you want to leave Islam, you are executed. I say, what kind of religion is this? Apostasy. You decide you don't want to be a Muslim anymore and they'll kill you? Sounds pretty serious. You know, and they say, okay, that's why so many of you don't convert, because you're afraid of death. You know? <laughs> reality, reality is that, of course, in the West, they do execute people for treason. Isn't it? You commit treason, you sell state secrets to the enemy, you will be executed. So the issue of the state and protection of that state is one big enough that, we, that you can be killed for. In Islam, religion and the state are one. Islam is not like a religion as the West understands religion, which is a private affair. So the idea for you to be killed about making a, a private affair, uh, you know, your choice in a private affair, this sounds ludicrous, ridiculous. How? You choose to be a, a this or a that, or you change, your, they're going to kill you? No, no, this is personal. So they have to understand that religion in Islam is not a personal affair alone. Yes, it has a personal element, but it is the state. So when a person uh, leaves Islam publicly, they are challenging that state. So it is like an act of treason. And this is why the law is so severe. And that is for the person who publicly goes out and says, I have left Islam. Islam is this, that and the other. Yes, that person will be executed. Islam instituted that law in Medina when what the Jews were trying to mess up the Muslims. What they did, and it's mentioned in the Quran, they would come into Islam in the morning and in the afternoon they would leave Islam to try to shake the faith of the believers. So the law came. You come into Islam in the morning, you better not leave in the afternoon. <laughs> okay? So you can't play with Islam, you have to be serious. You become a Muslim, you become a Muslim because you really believe it. You're serious in it, you come into it. You know? So just to protect the state from people trying to disrupt it and to undermine the religion, etc. So that's the general principle. But if you personally you know, leave Islam and you keep quiet about it, nobody's going to hunt you down. We don't have inquisition courts, like the Spanish Inquisition, you know, spread, spread all across Europe. People whose faith was being tested. We don't have that. You personally don't believe, you keep it to yourself, nobody's going to hunt you down. Or you leave the country. You leave the Muslim country, you go into a non-Muslim country, you want to make, make a big poster, say, I left Islam. We're not going to send any agents after you to go kill him, we have to take this person out. No. That's your choice, you've done it outside the country, that's your business. But inside the country, inside the Muslim country, then we wouldn't tolerate it to protect the weaker elements of the society. Where if somebody is openly rejecting Islam, that can get into the hearts of others whose Islam is shaky and draw them into disbelief also. So it's for the protection of the society as a whole, you know, this law is there. And as I said, we stress the concept of uh, Islam and state being one. So those are the main points. Inshallah, you know, there were some other issues concerning music. You can read about it. And terrorists and jihad 
Um, the only thing I would just say uh, concerning terrorism is that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. You know, when you read the definition for who a terrorist is from the American government, it means that those who did the American Revolution were all terrorists. To liberate America from British rule, whatever, they were terrorists, based on their own definition. So it just depends on who is looking at the, the picture. Of course, there is a general principle that we do hold, that there are some acts which we don't have any doubt that these are terrorist acts, where violence is directed at innocent uh, members of the society, children and others who are not combatants, that this for us is terrorism, not acceptable Islamically. And those Muslims who interpret the eye for the eye, meaning you kill our women and children, we will kill your women and children, they have not understood Islam, because that's not what Islam says. If they kill our women and children, then we have to kill them. The people who did it, not the people, their family members who didn't do it. This is not how the eye for the eye works. Eye for the eye, you knock out my eye, I have the eye, right to have your eye knocked out. Not your brother's eye, your sister's eye, your mother's eye. No, your eye. If you knock out my mother's eye, then it's your eye that needs to be taken out. Not your mother's eye. So that's not how eye for the eye operates. So some people have used that to justify uh, acts of terrorism directed against non-combatants in the society. In Islam, where we see that happening, we should not support it. We should recognize and accept that it is not acceptable, it is wrong Islamically, and stand on that. But at the same time, we, it is important for us to let them understand that there are reasons let us not just ignore what has happened in the country. So those certain people, you know, cutting off Bigley's head on the television, you know, if it is done by Muslims, uh, we don't support it. We say this is wrong, it should not have been done. But at the same time, there was a bigger wrong going on, which was attacking Iraq, you know, uh, and devastating that country, killing many of its civilians, etc., etc. That was a bigger wrong. That was not right. So. We don't, although on one hand we recognize where there's wrong, we don't just stop there, we also try to take those issues back to the primary causes and look and see, well, here, this, this, there was a bigger wrong here. These people in desperation, they've done these things, don't we, don't, though we don't endorse these desperate actions, at the same time, we also are opposed to what took place in the first place. Um, basically, my, my story begins uh, in first year university. Um, I had a year where I think a lot of problems happened to me. Uh, my parents separated that year. My dog died. That was a particularly tough day. Um, <laughs> subhanAllah. Uh, I had two car accidents in the space of one week. Um, and also, sadly, I had a friend pass away that year. I think that year led me to sort of ask some questions along the lines of why am I here? Why? What's the purpose of life? Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I even bother? Why don't I just sit on the couch, watch TV, Jerry Springer, whatever? And I think I started to ask questions about, you know, the purpose of life. And that led me to start to do a bit of a holy quest. Naturally, as an Aussie, the first thing I did was investigate Christianity. Um, I had a few Christian, Christian friends and um, I remember going to a church camp. It was one of the funniest uh, camps I've ever been to in my life. Everybody was singing. I didn't know what the words were. I didn't know what they were saying. It sounded great. They had beautiful voices, but uh, it just seemed really strange. And everybody was telling me how much God loved me. And I was thinking, God loves me? My dog died. <laughs> SubhanAllah. <laughs> So I kept on investigating Christianity and I went to a whole lot of, uh, I guess, different aspects of Christianity. So we're talking about Catholicism, uh, we're talking about Anglican, Baptist, you know, priests, pastors. And every time I'd go there and ask questions, I'd find that 
They wouldn't pick up the Bible and start to say, oh, this is the answer, my dear brother. They would just start answering me. They would just answer from their own opinions. And I started to realise that there was a lot of interpretations of, of Christianity and a lot of people had their own interpretations and one priest from one church was believing one particular aspect of Christianity whilst another was proclaiming another. So I started to think to myself, the Bible is one text, but there seems to be so many different interpretations, and it was confusing. Um, at the time, while I was in first year university, I was also working in a service station, one of my part-time jobs, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues was a Hindu, was an Indian Hindu, and uh, we'd regularly change shift, and uh, at that time I was very inquisitive, and I'd say to him, Dude, what's the deal with the elephant head guy? You know, what, what's the deal with that, you know? Why has that guy got an elephant head? And he's going, oh, that's Ganesha, you know, this, this. I said, we couldn't you have chosen like a lion's head or some, something a bit better? We'd have, you know, these real, really deep theological debates while people were buying petrol. And I'd be saying, yeah, but why bring five bucks of gas tanks, mate? Yeah, no problems. And uh, again, I, I found that that was very hard to stomach. So. I sort of investigated a little bit further. I went into, I had a, a good friend of mine who was a Mormon, um, and I found that this religion actually appealed to me the most out of all of the Christian religions, the, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints. They were quite strict. Um, they don't drink uh, alcohol. Um, they, they don't drink caffeine, so unfortunately Coke's out, guys, because I know Levos love Coke. <laughs> Um, but uh, again, you know, there was that leap of faith I felt that I had to make to, to embrace this religion. And I found that, you know, I wasn't just into making a leap of faith, I wanted proof. I also investigated Judaism, would you believe? Um, and my original name before Abu Bakr is Reuben. So if you've probably seen all the movies, you've seen Reuben Stein at the end, they probably thought I was Jewish. So they thought, oh, this guy's, you know, one of us. But again, you know, I, I just didn't find what I, what I was looking for. Um, lastly, I probably looked into Buddhism and I found that this was probably the the religion that I was going to choose. I thought, look, this is great. You know, there's um, there's so much, uh, you know, people people at peace here. They seem to be really switched on. Um, and they seem to be living one with the world. And that's what really appealed to me. But the more and more I looked into it, I guess I realised that it wasn't a religion of God. It was just a nice way to live. Um, one of my friends, one of my, my close friends, who's a Christian, um, would you believe, said, tell me the religions that you've investigated. So I went through them. I said, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, da da da, da. He goes, what about Islam? You know, Islam? I go, they're terrorists. I'm not going to investigate that religion. They're crazy. Why would I even look at that religion? But, lo and behold, I found myself walking into a mosque one day. This is my eternal quest. So I walked straight in, shoes on, straight across the prayer rug. There was a brother praying. I walked straight in front of him. As he went to go into sojourn, I almost stepped on his head. SubhanAllah, I didn't have any clue what I was doing. I looked over and I saw this brother. You probably know this guy. This is Abu Hamza. He's come here and he's lectured a few times. Um, SubhanAllah, I call him Abu Da'an because uh, he's got a very large beard. MashaAllah. He came walking out towards me and I thought, today I'm about to die. <laughs> this is the last day of my life. I'm a dead man. I'm a white boy in Leblad. What am I going to do here? I'm dead. He came walking across as though he just walked out of the Sahara Desert. Big abaya, big beard. But subhanAllah, the first words he said were, G'day mate, how you going? <laughs> if only he had the can of VB, it would have been perfect. <laughs> SubhanAllah, I was very taken aback by, uh, by his welcoming nature. Um, as Aussies, I guess now, I don't want to offend any Australians here, but my, my upbringing is from a, a country upbringing. Um, my parents raised me as an atheist. They were raised as Christians. They were dragged along to church every Sunday, and they hated every minute of it. So as soon as we were born, they drummed it into our heads that when you die, you're worm food. That's it. There's no afterlife. There's no God. It's all rubbish. So I was raised as, a, as an atheist. So when I walked across and, uh, and, and I, I saw Abu Hamza and he was talking to me um, in a very polite fashion, which I was very thankful for because I was sure I'd seen him on the five o'clock news hijacking a plane the day before. <laughs> now, 
Aussies are hospitable, don't get me wrong, but Lebos are the most hospitable people I've ever come across. And as the brother Hamza was saying, these brothers were making me cups of tea, you know, and I honestly needed to keep going to the toilet every five minutes. They just kept putting tea in front of me, biscuits. I'd never seen anything like it. And I think to some degree I kept coming back for the biscuits, but also for the religion. <laughs> So when I sat down with these brothers, I actually started asking questions. I asked all the questions that I've asked of, uh, of the, the priests, of the pastors, of, um, of my friends. And subhanAllah, the, the thing that really struck me is that every time I asked the question, they wouldn't just answer. They would pick up a Qur'an and they would say, read this bro, read this. And there was the answer, every single time. And I would ask another question, you know, you know, the hard questions, not the easy questions. Why do women have to wear the scarf? Why, why the, the hijab? How come I can have four wives and she can't have four husbands? You know, I wanted to know all the tough questions, which is the first questions I guess you ask when, uh, when you come across Islam. But lo and behold, they kept on answering the questions with the Qur'an, not from their own opinion. And I got frustrated with this. And I actually said to one of the brothers, because by this stage I'd, I think I'd been going there for about a couple of weeks, there was always a few brothers there when I went. And I said to one of the brothers, I said, you know, what's your opinion on the matter? Why won't you give me your opinion? And one of the brothers turned to me one day and said, how can I have an opinion when this is the Word of God? SubhanAllah, I remember that really hit me. So I asked them if I could take a Qur'an home. And I didn't say I was going to use it to chalk up the couch or anything like that. I said I was going to respect the book. So they, I took it home. I started reading it. Um, what I found was, while reading it, it wasn't as though I was reading a story. It was as though I was reading someone commanding me, you know, someone giving me guidance. And uh, one night I decided to really try and get the spiritual mood happening. And I'm sure you, probably some of you have heard this story before, so I apologise. Um, I'd lit a candle. <laughs> I had the window open, I had the curtains drawn, you know, I was trying to get that really spiritual feeling. It was a nice summer night in Melbourne, as summer as it can get in Melbourne. And uh, I was sitting there thinking, this is it, you know, this is the night. I'd been, you know, investigating all the spiritual proofs, all the scientific proofs about the fact that the mountains are the pegs, about, you know, how, how the, the embryo develops inside, uh, you know, the woman, all these amazing proofs, but I still needed that little push. It's like I was on the edge of a cliff, I was ready to jump, I just needed a push. So I was sitting there, it was very quiet. I was reading Quran and I stopped. I said, Allah, this is my moment. This is the time I'm about to jump into Islam. All I need is just a sign. Just a little sign, nothing huge, maybe a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Maybe half the house could fall down or something, you know, just, just small. It's small for you, man. You, you created the earth. Come on. So I sat there. I was waiting for the candle to start lighting up to four metres high like in the movies. And I go, OK, go. And subhanAllah, nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. I was really disappointed, to be honest. So I sat there and I said, Allah... This is your chance. <laughs> I'm here. I'm not going nowhere. I'll give you another chance. Okay, maybe you were busy. You know, I know it's daytime over the other side of the world. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Maybe this time it could just be like a car backfiring. You know, something small. All right, the half the house, the candle. Let's forget that. A bird could fart outside. I don't care. Just anything. <laughs> so I said, okay, go. And subhanAllah, absolutely nothing happened. And I mean, I couldn't have even said, oh, that was it. That, that creep just then in the wall, that was it. Absolutely nothing happened. I was really disappointed. I was gutted. I, I was sitting there thinking, this is it, you know. This was my last chance, Islam. And, and I really, I haven't found it. I pulled back the Qur'an. I, I turned back to where I was reading. SubhanAllah, the very next verse on the next page. For those of you who ask for signs, have we not shown you enough already? Look around you. Look at the stars. Look at the sun. Look at water. These are the signs for the people of knowledge. SubhanAllah. I threw the doona over my head and I, I pretended I was asleep. I was that scared because I couldn't believe how arrogant I'd been to want my own specific sign when all the signs had been there for me all along. 
the fact that we have this world, the fact that there is this creation, these are the signs for all of us. The next day I decided this is it, I'm becoming a Muslim. I've been investigating uh, Islam now for probably about six months, to be honest. I went in and I said to myself, this is it, I'm going to make shahada. I had no idea what I had to say, I had no idea what the words were. It was probably close to Isha prayer, so it would have been, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, I went in and, and I couldn't believe it, there was about a thousand people at the mosque. I thought, subhanAllah, look at this religion. Look at how strong they are. It was the first night of Ramadan. <laughs> Ramadan Muslims. <laughs> so I sat there and I was very nervous, I must admit. I got up and this person's going to me, you got to say these words, bro, Ash Hadu. I'm going, what? Ash what? <laughs> Can't I just say it in English? Now they say, no, you got to say it in Arabic. And I thought, looked out over the sea of beards that I could see in front of me and I thought, if I get these words wrong, I'm a dead man. Again, I had this fear, you know? And they were staring at me and I don't know if you know this, but Australians can't stare. Lebanese people can stare. <laughs> So I was sitting there, I was very scared. I got up and subhanAllah, as soon as I started to say the words, all fear went out of my mind. It felt as though a shower was inside my head and someone had just turned on the cold tap. It felt like I'd been flushed clean. I said the words and I wasn't expecting so many brothers to come up and yell Takbir Allahu Akbar and start kissing me and hugging me. Now, I'd never been kissed by that many men in my life. <laughs> but it was a beautiful day, I must admit. And that day was the day that I had more brothers than I could ever, uh, ever imagine, more sisters as well. But um, I guess since that day I've never looked back. My family, I think, initially were very worried that uh, I was going to be I guess a little bit weird towards them. That they thought that I was going to break out the AK-47s and the grenades. Uh, but they realised, I think, soon that, that this religion was actually making me a better person. Prior to Islam, you're not going to believe it, I had a mohawk. <laughs> I did. I had, uh, I'm not going to show you any photos. Um, I had army greens. I had the Metallica t-shirt. I had the cherry docks. I was shocking, right? I thought I looked great, but I looked terrible. And alhamdulillah, ever since then I look as good as I do now. No, don't laugh, please. <laughs> but my parents were the first people to actually say to me once, which really um, amazed me. They said, my father actually asked me for the Qur'an recently, which I was really happy about. Um, I always thought he'd be one of the hardest people to, to work on. But uh, he said to me, ever since you've been a Muslim, you've been a better person. You're more reliable. <laughs> I can count on you to come and pick me up if my car breaks down. Whereas before I gone, Dad, I was drinking last night. I don't know if it's still out of my system. <laughs>
we have, for example, in different organizations, if we go to the hospitals, for example, where there are a lot of non-Muslims, you know, professionals, etc., you know, giving da'wah amongst them is possible. Uh, it's difficult for you to here to just go into a hospital and try to give da'wah amongst the hospital workers. It's, it's difficult. There you have at least some structures, some structures in the country which will allow and permit you to put up posters and to set up a table or to, you know, give out leaflets or whatever. So that is a positive element. And so we have, you know, quite a, quite a, a good number of people who are accepting Islam on a regular basis there. You know, focusing, for example, on housemaids. Actually, this is the biggest uh, source of people coming into Islam, or from housemaids, women who are mainly from Philippines, Sri Lanka, who work in Qatari homes. So the Qataris, are oftentimes, because though, obviously it will be Qatari families who practice Islam, you know, are decent examples of Islam, then it has an impact on the people who work with them. So they want to know something. Usually they, the families don't have any knowledge to, I mean, to, in their languages to be able to explain to them, so they bring them down to the centers. So we find people are being brought in. You know, you don't have to go out. Here, really, you have to go out to go find people. There, people are coming at you all the time. You know, people are being brought in. So that's a difference in the nature of the dawah there. Our center, actually, I mean, we have one center called QCPI, which is a government center from the Aukaf, which focuses on dawah into the families and the, the housemates and all these others. And then there's also our, our, the center I'm with, Khotaga Center. Um, we have two focuses. One, which are a series of lectures on Aqidah, on Tafsir and so on and so on, which is for both new Muslims and uh, Muslims who have been Muslims for so many years to increase their knowledge of Islam. So that is an ongoing program that we have. And we also have this dawah training program. So what we'll do, for example, we just finished a, a course for uh, female doctors at Hamad Hospital, one of the big hospitals there. Uh, every Saturday we had two hours for them and we taught them the same complete course. And then they would in turn be involved in dawah because being in a doc as a doctor you're in a very critical situation you know, to be able to give dawah to people. People are in a vul they're vulnerable in that sense. So that makes it much easier to, um, uh, to give them dawah. So we focus on different uh, levels of professionals in the society and invite them, train them, those who have some knowledge of English, and then let them go ahead and give dawah. So that is our focus. Okay, there's a written question here about dawah, no compromise in Islam. Uh, I'd like an explanation on that. Well, it depends on what you mean by no compromises in Islam. No compromises of our basic principles? True. We don't compromise basic principles. When the Quraysh asked the Prophet ﷺ to make a compromise, they said, okay, we understand that you are keen on this worshipping Allah alone, you know, and we can appreciate, you know, Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So, what we'll do is, one year we'll worship Allah along with you, and then one year, you know, you worship the others along with us. Of course, Prophet ﷺ could not accept that. When the Qurayshi leaders told the Prophet ﷺ, listen, we're interested, we'd like to come into Islam, but you've got to get rid of these low-class people you have around you. These slaves and others who became Muslims, you know, we can't sit with these people. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? said, okay, I'll get rid of them so we can sit. No. You can't compromise. So, those basic things in terms of conveying the message, etc., we don't make compromises on. But if we say, um, by establishing priorities, you see, some people mistake priorities to be compromise. Somebody wants to accept Islam. Woman, she's been married 20 years. She's got five kids. She wants to accept Islam. Do you need to tell her that, listen, once you become a Muslim, you are separate from your husband, you can no longer be with your husband anymore, and blah, blah. That can stop her in her tracks. That will stop her in her tracks. So is it a compromise that you don't get into that? That you leave it, you focus on her building her knowledge of Islam and increasing herself in Islam, etc., etc. And even if somebody tells her, 
And unfortunately, you'll find some Muslims who are there ready to tell her. <laughs> she has to know this. You know? You, know? you can explain to her, listen, it is better for you to become a Muslim and stay with your husband than for you not to become a Muslim. Is that a compromise? When a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu young man, right, he came to him, Sahaba around the Prophet Sallallahu and said, O Prophet of Allah, I would like to accept Islam, but could you give me permission to fornicate? What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? Get out of here! The Sahaba, they were, <laughs> get this guy out of here, you know? Prophet Sallallahu said, said, no, leave him. <laughs> Sit him down. And he asked him, you know, would you like somebody to fornicate with your mother? He said, no, 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 not my mother. Or would you like somebody to fornicate with your sister? No, no, not my sister. Your daughter? No, 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 my, your aunt? No, 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 no. He said, well, whoever that you do that with will be somebody's mother or their sister or their aunt. He got the message. He got the message. Was it a compromise? Not to have just driven him off with that horrible question he was asking? You know, see, some people understand compromise meaning that you have to give them the harsh reality of Islam. We call it sledgehammer Islam. You know, you come with your sledgehammer, you're just cracking people over the heads, you know. <laughs> you know this, that's how you give your da'wah. No. Well, that, that is, uh, you know, as Allah said, you know, لو كنت فضلاً غليظ القلب لن فضل من حولك. You know, if you were harsh, hard in your heart, people would have fled from around you. They wouldn't have been interested in the message. Yeah, um, I want to ask you a question when you're doing, um, doing da'wah. This morning on the um, radio I was he hearing about, you know, because Ken Bigley got beheaded. And the lady was saying, you know, we should just, if they behead ours, we should behead theirs. And I'm sure we'll probably meet people like that view on the street. Now, if someone comes to you with that view of, like, you know, primitivism, beheading and all that, how should you take the flow of the conversation? Because, I mean, that's very hard to do because this emotional anger. What should you do? What's the best line? Okay, um, actually we're going to cover that in this next session when we start back up we'll be covering that. We have what is called the power principle to deal with it. You know, you have to uh, the person who's coming with, to you with emotional anger you have to neutralize that. You know, you have to settle them down, calm them down. You know, otherwise you'll not be able to communicate. You'll just be head on. Right? So you have to be able to neutralize. And basically the point is that where Muslims have done something wrong, you can't defend it. You can't say, well, you know, they're justified in doing it. No. So you, where something is wrong, you have to accept. This is, this is hideous. This is not from Islam. I don't agree with it. I, you know, I, I, I'm with you. This is something terrible. It should not be done. But, but there's a but. Coming into the people's country, blowing them up and, you know, taking over their oil and all these other things, this is an evil also. You know, this is a big evil. Yes, it's a big evil which has led people to do these kinds of things. Not that we agree with the kinds of things they're doing, but we also has, must look at the root of the problem. So you take them from the individual act to go to look at the root, the root of it. To understand that this is oppression. There is evil that has taken place there. You know, and no society would, would, can justify this evil. So we try to take them back to the core issues, you know, and recognize where there's wrong, we recognize it. We say this, this, Islam doesn't condone this. It's not from Islam. Individuals do it. When the IRA, you know, did with things that they did, did we uh, blame it on Catholicism? Catholic IRA terrorists? No, no. No, they were IRA terrorists. They did things. But they did have a cause. They did have issues. Political issues, etc., you know, which had to be resolved. Uh, wearing clothes plays a vital role. Should we dress up in Islamic clothes or English clothes? Well, um, we have principles of dress which Islam requires of us. As long as we are fulfilling those principles of dress Islamically, then we can dress whether it is taking from the dress of the people of the land that we're in or not. As long as that dress is not unique to them, specific things that they wear, which are accessories like ties, for example, for men, you know, 
it's an accessory. It is not a necessity. It's not a necessary part of dress. Wearing a jacket, this is something necessary. You freeze to death otherwise, you know. So you, so those things, so you take from their clothing, fine. As long as in your clothing, you maintain the Islamic guidelines. You know, your pants are not below your ankle. You know, they're not tight. They show your thighs, etc. You know, they should be very loose. As long as they uh, follow Islamic principles so that the body parts are not exposed, then there is leeway. And from there, one makes one's own ijtihad in one circumstance. If one is coming into a charged atmosphere where the non-Muslims are, you know, hyped up, where they react very strongly to, you know, Muslim dress, etc., obvious Muslim dress, then to tone your dress down a bit for that circumstance is acceptable. It's acceptable. But it's still, again, that's your own individual ijtihad. We can't really say that, no, you should wear this dress all the time, or no, you should not, because where there's leeway in the deen, then we don't want to, you know, make it so narrow that nobody else can follow it. I have encountered some problems in regards to uh, some Christians who say that I have felt the Holy Spirit. Um, and like you said, that they have that emotional attachment. But they truly believe that the Holy Spirit is in front of them. And they are speaking to the Holy Spirit. They say that we raise our hands and we speak to Him. And He responds. So how would you respond to that? Well, you know, I would just say that you believe. I mean, obviously it is an issue of belief in the Holy Spirit and that this uh, took place, uh, that um, we can find, same thing you can say to them among Hindus, you know, who believe uh, in the spirit, because when they worship their idols, right, they will say, yeah, you see a physical idol here, but we are not worshiping that physical idol. But God becomes concentrated in that idol at the time. God who is in me and in you, he becomes concentrated. It's a, it's a portal to reach God. And I can feel God at that time. What do you think about that one? You know? So what you feel can be a result of a variety of things. You've been told that it was this or it was that, and so that's what you've accepted. But other people feel the same thing and interpret it another way. So really, if we want to analyze right and wrong in this matter, we can't do it according to our feelings. We can't do it according to our feelings. According to people's feelings in India, you have uh, this guy Sai Baba in southern India. Sai Baba has 8 million followers who believe that he is God incarnate. He comes amongst them and they experience what they feel to be a godly presence. Though he has been accused of abuse, because he's a bachelor, He's been accused of abuse, you know, of his male followers and all this stuff. People come from America and that, and, you know, there's a whole number of their fo former followers who have written things against him for, you know, homosexual abuse, sodomy, and all this kind of stuff. But it's hidden from the main followers. He still comes amongst the main followers, and they feel his presence. He does magic. He's involved in doing some magic tricks and stuff, and they're just blown away. You could never convince one of them that this wasn't God. So we say these things, you know, we, we try to stay away from emotions in this matter because as they say, emotions are blind. They say love is blind. You know, it's a common phrase in the West. Love is blind. Why? That emotion, when a person is in love, then they can't see that person clearly anymore. They can't see any of the negative qualities, etc. They can only see this person, you're in love with that person, finished, that's it. So you try to explain to them, no, no, really, this person is not a good person. Like, no, 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 you don't know what you're talking about, so on, so on, so on. Because emotionally, their judgment has been clouded. So we have to say, listen, we want to understand who God is. We have to do it according to reason. God gave us the ability to reason for a purpose. <coughs> they want to say divine mystery, etc. No, no, no. God gave us reason to understand him. Listen to the reason of the early prophets. Were they talking the kind of reason you're talking? You know, so and so. How do you deal with a person who um, is asking about Islam, 
But when you explain Islam to them, they don't really, they don't understand anything of it. You speak to them about Allah and Islam, you generally explain Islam to them, but they don't understand any, anything of it, but they still want to go ahead with it. What do you do in that situation? If a person, your question, you have explained Islam to them, they haven't understood it, but they want to become a Muslim. Should you give them shahada? Is that what you're asking? Even though they don't really understand it? Well, I would advise them to wait and do it out of understanding. Because if, you, um, if they're going to insist on becoming Muslims, then you need to find out why. Why? Why would you want to go ahead and do something, come into this thing, even though you don't understand it? You see, and if they're coming in for the wrong reasons, then you don't want them to do that. You want them to come in for the right reasons. And it should be based on knowledge. Basic knowledge. How about if you sort of reason with yourself and say, well, perhaps if we give him the shahada and he enters Islam, and then perhaps he can be cultured around the environment and slowly develop into a knowledgeable Muslim, and would that justify you giving, giving him the shahada? I don't believe so. That is the rationale used by you know some people whose da'wah techniques is to go into poor areas, right? And you buy cheap watches from Taiwan or whatever, and you offer these watches. You say, you like a watch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People gather around and say, okay, you just raise your hand and say, Shadu Allah, ilaha illallah, I'll give you a watch. So you find all these people do it. After that, you tell them, you're all Muslims now. And you tell the Muslim community, okay, these are a bunch of new Muslims, take care of them, and you're gone. No, we don't accept this. It's not acceptable da'wah. You know, the declaration of faith, we know the first condition for its validity is that it be based on knowledge. If it's not based on knowledge, it has no validity. It may become valid later on or whatever. That's not when I'm denying what could happen later. But it is, at that time, invalid. To what extent must the knowledge be of this father? The extent that they know who Allah is. He had no father, no son, etc. They at least know and they accept that, yes, Allah is one, unique in his oneness, etc., etc. Basic. They accept that Muhammad Sallallahu was a messenger of Allah, the last messenger of Allah. And it's enough, maybe they haven't read all about Muhammad Sallallahu to say, yeah, yeah, nay, but you say if you accept the Qur'an, you accept the Qur'an, right, as being the truth, you read it, you're convinced by it. Or the system of Islam, you recognize this had to have come from God, then by you accepting that it had to have come from God, you're accepting the one who brought it, had to have brought it from God. So you can accept without knowing the details of the Prophet's life that the Prophet Muhammad was the last of the messengers by accepting the system of Islam or the Quran as being from God. And that is the basis for the Shahada. Knowledge of the pillars of Islam and the pillars of Iman, I mean these are things that you can inform them about but if a person uh, is coming in and you know they say well I, I don't know if I can pray five times a day maybe I can pray once or twice. <coughs> Uh, you can give them shahada. You can give them shahada and you say, you know, of course you work on it. You know, the goal is to pray five times a day. I mean, you know that this is what is required of you. And you do it as much as you can. Mm. Uh, saying is the most important thing is that sincerity first. That the person, even though he might not have a complete knowledge of Islam, but he might have just the one point which made him sincere, out of sincerity to accept Islam. So the most important thing, would it be the, the, the sincerity or the knowledge? Which one? Well, um, okay, brother's asking the issue of uh, sincerity and knowledge, because of course, when the scholars describe, you know, the realities for validity of shahada, after knowledge, they usually put sincerity. So it's, come in, it's really among the conditions. There's sometimes seven, eight different conditions scholars have identified. But when you look at them, they're usually ranging between knowledge and sincerity, things related to them, evidences of sincerity, the love and the commitment and all these other things. So the issue of sincerity, yes. I mean, that is uh, between that individual and Allah. Sincerity is not something you can judge. 
Whereas knowledge is something you can judge. Either they have understood that Jesus was not the Son of God or they, they haven't. That is something you can judge and say, okay, you can go ahead and make shahada. But can I say no? Is he really sincere? You see, that's something inside his heart. So that is a condition between him and Allah or she and herself and Allah whether that shahada is valid or not. But for us, when we're going to give the shahada, it is enough to deal with what is zahir, what is obvious, what we can judge. So the knowledge test, they make this really the primary condition. Um, I'd just like to ask that the two concepts between equality and justice, and seeing there's some distinct, distinction, distinct, distinction made there, if you can comment on that. Because I've, uh, what I've heard is that there is no equality in the sense that it's in the Western sense, but what there is is justice. I don't know if you can comment on that. Well, uh, brother's question concerning uh, the issue of equality and justice in Islam, uh, marriage, uh, situations uh, from an Islamic perspective I mean this usually comes up in the case of polygamy equality and justice you know equality and fairness where equality establishes justice then that is what is required where equality becomes unfair then that is cancelled and we f focus on fairness meaning a man has two wives he spends one day with one wife, one day with another wife. That is equality and that is just and fair. One wife has ten kids, the other wife has no kids. He gives both of them the same amount of maintenance money. That's equality, but that's unfair. I think the point is clear in that context. In terms of human beings in society, Males and females are equal before God in terms of their responsibility to worship God. But uh, in terms of what is required of them, it will be according to their natures, according to their abilities. So it will not be equally required of them. Women will be excused from some things, males are not excused from. Uh, um, women may be not required or required to do some things males are not required to do you know so there is we don't talk about equality from that perspective but uh, what God has deemed fair or just from each individual this is what is required of them and even in the society in which we say okay it's a for among males themselves are all males equal yeah, they're equally responsible before God. But are they equal? No. Males are not all equal. You know, some are more intelligent than others. Some are stronger than others. You know, some, uh, we have, uh, some are richer than others. People are on different levels. Really, people are not really equal. They're only equal in terms of their responsibility to God. What is the ruling of a sister who wears niqab and has to teach students aged up to 16 years old, considering some of them are male? Well, um, the issue of teaching uh, males for a female standing in front of males teaching males is not uh, a good circumstance Islamically. She shouldn't. They should be below puberty if she's uh, going to be teaching them males. Otherwise, she should just be teaching females. Um, but in a circumstance where she's the only one able to teach that particular uh, text, whatever, or the material, you know, exceptions can be made. And um, uh, some arrangements should be made in terms of uh, the seating arrangements and these kind of things to keep the males at a distance. Otherwise, as we said, as a general principle, uh, females uh, teaching males above the age of puberty would not be uh, permissible because of the fact that it is drawing attention to themselves. The, the, the tendency for people is to uh, look at those people you know, who are teaching them. And uh, there's a particular pro prohibition with regards to males and staring at females. 
There is some relaxation in regards to females. It is not held in the same light as males because of the consequences and because of the difference in the natures. The other point I'd just like to remark on this question which came to me is it has 786 on the top of it. And um, you should just take note that 786 does not mean Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In fact, the writing of 786 is considered to be bid'ah, an innovation. It is numerology. And numerology is a, a, a prohibited uh, science or art. You know. In fact, 786 could mean that there is no God and Muhammad وسلم, was not a messenger of God. Because you're depending on the meanings of let the, the you're giving values to letters, saying that alif equals one, ba equals two, ta uh, abjad, jim equals three, dal equals four, and so on and so forth. And then you're adding it all up to get you 786. But I could contrive a sentence in Arabic which says there is no God. You know, God is uh, materials, and it add up to 786. So this is why this is not valid in the first place. And in the second place, as I said, it's a part of the numerological system uh, which was devised by the Jews. The Muslims adopted it from the Jewish practice of, this is where the Kabbalah and the working, the, their calculations come from. Well, as the Prophet had said, that he is the guardian for one who has no guardian. Right? That um, he provides maintenance and he inherits. That the woman who has no guardian, then the state, and the representative of the state would be a judge or whatever, or if it's a community, the representative of the community becomes the guardian for that woman. And uh, they, through that guardian, she would be looked after. And if she died and left something behind, the state or the community would inherit that and distribute it according to need. Is that clear? Well, since this question about today's society where the state may not be able to uh, sufficiently look after her, well, well, this is why we have, I mean, when we're talking about the state, we're not, obviously not talking about this state. We're talking about the ideal Islamic state. We're talking about ideals and, you know, uh, idealistic principles or how it functioned in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu what, what would happen for, for people who had no relatives and they were taken care of. The state would find the means to take care of them. They would be given priority through the zakah. The zakah would be used to help to take care of them. Uh, um, also, you have, as a norm in many Muslim communities, you have charitable organizations. These organizations would be brought to bear to help the state if the state can't, you know, to make up for what uh, fall, the state falls short on. So there are instruments within the, the Muslim community which should look after them. But I mean, of course, you know, if we say today, England, no state, communities, hardly taking care of themselves, their needs. Now what about a woman in this circumstance? Well, in this circumstance, obviously, uh, you know, she will not be looked after as she should be. You know, and um, all kinds of other things are happening. You know, um, uh, men who should, in certain circumstances, take the children, don't get the children. Uh, so there's a number of other things which are happening here, which we can't address from a legal perspective. I mean, with each case would have to be dealt with uh, on its own merit. You know, uh, 
And uh, if, for example, a, uh, a woman, say, was married to a non-Muslim, she accepts Islam, and she divorces her husband, he doesn't want to accept Islam, and she doesn't, you know, she chose to go according to Islamic law and separate from him, on to divorce. And the state is going to give her money, from his money, and she has no one to look after her. Should she take that money? This is a ruling of this state. Yeah, in her circumstance, yes. If she has another circumstance where she has means, she is being taken care of, then she can forego it. But where that need exists there, and there is no other alternatives, then that is her right, given by the state, she can take it. So, as I said, it would ha we'd have to look at it on an individual basis. And um, what we're speaking about are basically ideal circumstances in the Muslim communities. Any uh, further question on that? Okay. Once a man has declared divorce, can he change his mind after? Is this the purpose of the three months waiting period? Yes. That's one of the